I should tell you that w one of the glories of the Hoban uh, movement has been that um, we've had been able to connect people directly with Ireland. In fact, apart from Andrew, whom we're working on, all the speakers in the second part of the program um, have spoken in Ireland and sometimes been even more organically involved. Uh, our next speaker is only in that category by a matter of, what, two months. But uh, he, he had a, a unique situation as a dynamic writer in the New York style, which covers virtually everything that moves in the universe, as you know. <laughs> there is nothing that a New York writer will not take up and write about um, and do so brilliantly and effectively. Not always in the best paid situations, but um, I, I don't think he's written for the New Yorker yet, but that surely cannot be very far off. Because Robert Clara um, came to our attention because he had written a definitive book on the Truman reconstruction of the White House. And in doing that, he interviewed the daughter of the man who had carried out that reconstruction, a man called John McShane. And John McShane had the interesting um, attribute of owning, at one time, the lakes of Killarney. Uh, he bought that as part of a consortium and eventually ended up with a house uh, that he, he didn't die in, but his wife died in, I believe. And when his wife died in 1998, the state of Ireland actually acquired it. And they then had to deal with the impatience of John McShane's daughter, who was a nun and still alive, in that they didn't do anything with it. Uh, for various reasons to do with lack of resources. But in actual fact, in the recent couple of years, they eventually got their act together and redid that house. And so as part of the celebrations of the opening of the reconstructed Killarney House, we were able to bring Robert Clara to Ireland and have him speak uh, at the little session that we ran down there to celebrate that. So. He has a wonderful story to tell, and I'm delighted to introduce Robert Clara. Um, there are several people in this room who have written very impressive books, and I have developed the habit of never assuming that the people in a room like this are familiar with my own. Uh, so I'm, I want to give you just a little bit of background um, on my book before we get to, uh, to Sister McShane. Uh, this whole project for me uh, started with a single photograph, one that I came across uh, largely by accident. Uh, my first book was titled uh, FDR's Funeral Train, which required me to familiarize myself, obviously, with the Roosevelt's and also with the Roosevelt White House. And so I began amassing a lot of White House books uh, those great moldy smelling coffee table books that collect in some of our homes. And, um, and in one of those books, I found a photograph that just hit me over the head. And um, so when I first saw this photo, um, I actually thought for a second that I was looking at a parking garage. Um, and then when I looked at the caption, I was shocked that this was, in fact, the White House. Uh, I, I had known, of course, that Truman had done renovations to the house. Uh, I, I knew that they were more serious than changing the curtains. I had no idea that they were this extensive. Uh, and so I, I said to myself, well, there's obviously there's no way that something like this isn't a story. Uh, and so I did the thing that people do these days. I went to Amazon and I went looking for a book about this renovation. And uh, to my surprise, I did not find one. Uh, nobody had really taken on this topic exclusively and devoted a book to it. And uh, I decided that, well, maybe I should be that person who, who does that. Uh, so now some of my uh, illustrious colleagues who have preceded me today have touched on the renovation in, uh, in greater detail with more skill than I'm capable of doing it. But I just want to do a quick uh, recap because it'll serve my speech here. Uh, so here's like the two minute version or so. Uh, this picture here is uh, taken in 1846, which I believe is the earliest um, uh, photographic image of the White House. Um, James Hoban built the house for George Washington to the standards of the time. It was a country gentleman's house uh, to the standards of the late 18th century. Unfortunately, Mr. Hoban was working 
uh, before the development of soil mechanics. And so the house being built on sand, which is a mistake that presumably wouldn't be made today, uh, that uh, the blame for that is unfairly laid at Hoban's feet at times. Uh, what wasn't at all Hoban's fault also was the fact that the house, I don't want to say it was never properly maintained, but the wear and tear subjected to the house with the coming and going of every president was extraordinary. And uh, most houses aren't asked to, uh, to be that durable and take a beating quite like that. Uh, and then uh, with the dawn of the industrial age in particular, although it started a bit before then, every president that moved in began to install what would be called uh, improvements. Uh, the latest technology, of course, if everybody else had it or the Gilded Age robber barons had it, then the president had to have it. And so the White House had to accommodate, well, early on iron pipes for hot water and then phone and electrical conduits. Um, an elevator, air conditioning, all of this infrastructure was built into a house that was not designed to accommodate it. Uh, certainly the foundations were not, were not designed to accommodate the weight that these things added to the house. But more to the point, when you add a bunch of channels and conduits to an existing house, you obviously don't want them out in the open, so you have to conceal them somewhere, right? So where are you going to put them? Inside the walls and below the floors. And how are you going to do that? Well, of course, you just start hacking through the wood. Um, well, <clears throat> that can become a problem when you do too much of that. Uh, and so you had this culmination of problems, structurally, that built and built and built. And of course, somebody was going to pay the price for it. And unfortunately, that person was Harry Truman. By 1945, Harry Truman had big problems with the house. There are wonderful letters that survive of Truman sitting in his study, writing letters to Bess, talking about ghosts in the house, keeping him company. Now, Truman wasn't a spiritualist. What did he mean by ghosts? He meant, well, the floors creaked on their own, and there were these unexplained drafts in the corners, and picture frames would fall for no reason. Uh, if you were inclined to believe in the spirit realm, it must have been a really intense place to live. But what this was, in fact, was the house manifesting its many structural problems. Um, I'm going to cut to the quick here. Uh, uh, several structural surveys were done of the house early in Truman's term. The photo in the right uh, was one of the early survey images taken, and it shows a two-story crack running through an interior bearing wall. Uh, again, I don't have an architecture degree. I don't think you need one to realize that that is a big problem for a house. This is another one. Uh, for a time, this is a house, by the way, the house was essentially sinking. Uh, the weight was pulling the house down into the sandy soil, and the house was also simultaneously pulling itself apart as it sank because the center of the house was sinking faster than the outside of the house because the walls on the outside were thicker and as we were talking before, had better foundations. Uh, and so initially what they tried to do was just brace everything in hopes that that would help, although it certainly didn't help aesthetically. Um, and, but obviously this was a losing battle. So the Department of Public Buildings closed the house in January of 1949 and moved the Trumans across the street. So most of us know that. That's how that happened. Uh, Harry Truman formed something called the Commission on Renovation of the Executive Mansion. Uh, and this is them. They had assembled by the summer of 1949. Uh, these were men from uh, both houses of Congress, uh, architects, uh, engineers, this kind of thing. It was a very, actually a very, very adequate compendium uh, of skilled and reasonable men. And they decided, after weighing several options, that the only way to save the house, and I mean save is a relative term in this conversation, was essentially to gut the place. What they were going to preserve were the outer walls of the house, and everything else was going to go. Now, that's fine so far as decisions go, but the real work would actually have to be done by somebody. And that's kind of where my book starts to uh, begin in earnest. For months, I was gathering documents from the Truman Library, the Army Corps of Engineers, the White House Curator's Office. Uh, in time, I procured a copy of the official report, which was issued in a, a hardbound form at the end of the job. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. Um, 
And there in the back of the book, I found a contractor's name. And I'm ashamed to say it was a name I wasn't familiar with prior to seeing it. Uh, John McShane, Incorporated. Uh, and this was a jumping off point for me because I have a, an ethos, if you will, that I maintain in all the writing that I do, and hopefully I, I bear out the truth of it, which is that the most interesting story you can ever find of a thing is ultimately only interesting because of the way that people react to that thing. People understand events through the eyes and experiences of other people. And so when I saw John McShane, I thought, well, I need to get the perspective of this man. I need to describe the experience that this man had in a job like this. Well, McShane Inc. didn't exist anymore. Uh, a portion of its corporate files survived, and I was able to get those. But they were, you know, numerics and purchase orders and this kind of thing, very technical information. I was looking for a more human side to John McShane. Uh, so naturally, what happens? The researcher turns to, well, friends of his were not alive anymore either. Uh, so how about family members? Well, as it turns out, the McShanes had only one child, a girl, and her name was Pauline. She was born in 1928, and in 2010, when I was starting this research, that would have made her 82 years old. Uh, I knew also that she had become a Catholic nun, which was excellent news, not in an ecclesiastical sense as such. Uh, I'm not going to assume you guys are familiar with, but the National Institute of Aging a number of years ago did this wonderful thing called the Nun Study. It's known as this colloquially. And among its many findings uh, are that um, Catholic nuns tend to live longer than lay women. Uh, many of them tend to live to quite advanced ages. And uh, as somebody who went to St. Columba School in Hopo Junction, New York, I can tell you exactly how old some of those nuns get. Um, so I also knew that Pauline McShane obviously wouldn't have taken a married name, which is excellent news for the researchers, because that means you don't have to crank through the marriage records at the library on those microfilm machines for seven months. So I figured, hey, I had a good shot of finding her. I knew also that she had joined the Sisters of the Holy Child Jesus, and just for the heck of it, I looked on this internet thing, see what I could find, and right at the top, I found a photo of Sister McShane in an Irish daily. And my first thought was, wow, she looks great for 82. <laughs> so I found uh, her order, uh, and I wrote to them, on September 14th, 2010, asking as tactfully as I could if Sister McShane uh, were still with us. Four days later, I received an email. This one, Robert, you could relax. I am alive and well, although not as youthful looking as in a recent photo in an Irish daily. A researcher like me, or any researcher really, rejoices at a letter like this, not just because it means that you have a living source, but it means that she is welcoming, obviously intelligent, witty, and I thought, ha, I have to talk to her. So she and I had some back and forth via email, and I told her about my book, and specifically what I was trying to do with the book. And uh, she said, well, we could talk on the phone, and I said, I don't hate to be rude, but would you let me come down and visit you? And she said, yes. So I went down to her house in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, and uh, that's a, two hours or so on the train. I went to visit her two weeks before Christmas in 2011. I had planned to take no more than an hour or two of Sister McShane's time. Uh, as it turns out, she gave me her entire day. Uh, including putting me in her car and driving me all over Bryn Mawr. This is the only, the only person this could conceivably happen with. She slowed down in front of every church and said, Daddy built that, Daddy built that, Daddy built that. Uh, at this point, I also have to mention one other really important thing. From this point forward in the talk, I'm going to refer to Sister McShane as Polly. And the uh, ex-Catholic schoolboy in me shivers at that sort of familiarity, but I have been given permission by her cousin to do this. Uh, so a little bit of context then about her father. By 1949, when he took the White House renovation job, John McShane 
had already built more than 23 buildings in Washington, D.C. alone. That does not count all the other cities that he was active in. Um, in D.C., he had built the National Airport, the Pentagon, you know, that little place so over there. The, uh, the Jefferson Memorial, he had $100 million worth of buildings under contract at the time. He was already wealthy. He was already the third largest contractor in the United States. And tellingly, he was already known as the man who built Washington. I found this wonderful anecdote at the time in a magazine that a Washington tour guide uh, who took people around, as you see them now riding in these buses, um, he said, they don't want to know about George Washington anymore. They want to know about this McShane guy. That's how big he was at the time. So I had a lot to ask Polly. And the first thing that I wanted to bring up, but something that had surprised me as I had gone through the records of McShane's company, was that he had submitted a ridiculously low bid for the White House job in 1949. Um, government jobs like this were bid on a cost plus fixed fee basis. And I'm not going to get into all that, but what it essentially means is that the contractor would bid the number that would represent his profit. That was what he would walk away with to make it worth his while. And for a job like this, which could go on for several years, you had to cover your tail. And so most of the bidders were coming in at half a million, and many of them a good deal higher, closer to one million. John McShane bid $100,000 on this job, which was peanuts. And in a business sense, this was completely crazy. And I brought this up with Polly. It was a great way to kick off a conversation. Was your father crazy? <laughs> and she said, oh, no, he knew what he was doing. Quote, she said, he was determined to get that job. And he knew he would lose money, but he didn't care. It was worth it to him. So what kind of businessman would deliberately lose money? I know that's fashionable. It was fashionable in the dot-com era. But this is 1948. Um, and again, she told me, quote, he couldn't have cared less. It meant so much to him to have the privilege of building the White House. One of the things that Polly helped me to understand was that her father was a man with a very strong sense of duty. He was a proud man, but not in a self-important sense. His pride was in his work and how that work fit into the civic and, by association, patriotic landscape of the capital city. He was in a very unusual and somewhat privileged position for a builder to have the opportunity to affect the physical structure of Washington to the degree that he did. Uh, and I found an example of that pride, which was this magazine ad that McShane took out at his own expense. Um, after he had finished building the Jefferson Memorial in 1943, and he essentially thanks Thomas Jefferson for founding the country, and uh, it seemed to regard Jefferson almost as a fellow builder, in a sense. Jefferson had built a republic, and McShane was busy building DC. His pride in his work prompted him to put his name on the front fence of the White House. It impressed a lot of people, except Harry Truman, who walked past that the first morning it was up and said, take that thing down right now. Fortunately, someone popped a picture of it before that happened. I also had to raise with Polly her father's reputation as a businessman, because there were stories that came out in the accounts at the time of the White House reconstruction. In sum, he was an extremely talented, builder and also a very feared one as well. There were stories, notorious ones, that John McShane would show up at a job site and look around without even looking at the books. He could look around and tell if the job were making money or not, if it was losing money, where it was losing money. Uh, and then the story of him throwing a fit when his office assistant decided that a job that they were working on needed pencils and a stapler. And McShane didn't understand why such extravagances had to be purchased for the office. There was a profile in Nation's Business in 1952 that said, quote, he drives his men unmercifully. 
So this is a lot to raise <laughs> with your host. And I brought this up, and the first thing she said was, yes, that her father was a natural at business. From everything that she could see, she said, quote, he must have been a genius at figures, at estimating. She said to me, he could figure a job to the last nail. That was the secret of his success. What about him being a hard man? Yes, he was. But there were deeply personal reasons for that with John McShane. Polly said, quote, my father was an ambitious man. He was always driving to please himself, being the youngest child of four children. His mother died in childbirth. I didn't know that. And he was determined to prove himself. And in fact, McShane hadn't just lost his mother, but also his father when McShane was only 21 years old. And McShane was actually forced to leave college, suspend his studies, and he would never return to them because he had to take over the family's small construction business. What's my point? My point is that this was a man who had to grow up very quickly. Another reason for John McShane's drive, I would say fastidiousness to be kind, but he was extremely intense. And there was another reason, I think, for it. And that was just simply the precariousness of his industry in the construction trades, then and now. A serious mistake can destroy a company. <laughs> These contracts were not set up to protect the bidders. And at the time he was rebuilding the White House, McShane owned several hotels, including the Rittenhouse in Philadelphia, which is here. And this is where he lived in the penthouse with his wife, Mary. And Polly stayed there from time to time as well. And he had to have known that this level of comfort in which he had ensconced his family could disappear with one or two bad business decisions. And I want to bring in one other reason why it was no fun being John McShane in 1948 and 1949. And that was the simple pressure of a job as complex as renovating the White House. And now I'm going to generalize to a shameful degree because I could spend an hour on this. This drawing here is the best kind of summarial image that I could find that conveys the magnitude of what had to be done. The outer stone wall of the house, as I had mentioned before, would be the only thing that was kept. But the foundations, those were inadequate. Those would have to be brought down to the gravel level, where they would be given new, broader, spread footings. But that meant that those foundations had to be extended while the stone walls were still sitting above them. So that's not terribly an easy thing to do. Uh, I mean, it, it is done routinely, but it is a rather nerve-wracking process. While that was being done and the new basements excavated, there would have to be temporary steel that would go up inside that would support the top floor that Coolidge had put on because they made the decision to keep that. By the way, a cement top floor, let's just keep that. And then they had to build a steel skeleton that would actually become the structure of the house. And once it was in place, they would literally tie the steel framework to the outside of the house. So this was an extraordinarily complex thing. And not for nothing, this was a very important home. This was not the sort of thing that you'd make a mistake. Oh, we knocked down a column. It's OK. We'll take care of it. You know, the, the, the margin for error here was very, very low in an engineering point of view, but also from a public relations one as well. John McShane's reputation was never more at stake than it was in this job. And that house, I think it goes without saying, I'll say it anyway, it was fragile. Polly explained to me the White House was like an eggshell. My father told me the insurance they took out on it was huge for that reason. At one point, they were taking the steel I-beams that would go inside the house, and they were threading them through the window openings with a crane. And there were something like six inches of clearance on either side. I wouldn't want to watch that, even with no stake in it. So you have a demolition job and a preservation one, along with an excavation and a foundation and a steel frame job and a concrete job, plus interior finishing work to be done on 
I know I'm going to make a mistake on this, and Mr. Seal is going to correct me. I believe it was 132 rooms at the time. But let's just say, meh, in the neighborhood of 130. Each of those rooms, or most of them, marble, parquet, ornamental plaster, carved hardwood paneling. And all of this, of course, had to be done to extremely high standards. This was the most visible house in the country. And so all of that was John McShane's responsibility. And by the way, he had only 660 days to get it all done. And at that point, Polly turned to me and said, Robert, they had an impossible challenge. And I think McShane knew that. Here's another challenge of John McShane's. Uh, Harry Truman didn't win the moniker, uh, moniker give him hell Harry for nothing. Uh, Truman insisted that the White House work be top quality, naturally enough, but he also wanted everything done yesterday. As has, was mentioned before, he wanted to get in there to finish out his term. He was proud that he was undertaking the work, but he didn't want his entire presidency to be spent at Blair House across the street. And so as the delays mounted, Truman was looking at the calendar and, hmm, get me back in there. Polly said, quote, my father respected him, Truman, and tried to keep him happy, but Truman was after daddy constantly to get him back in the White House. He pressured my father constantly to move the job along. It was a huge amount of pressure. Now, no matter how many jobs he had going, John McShane always had made it home to Philadelphia. You know, he could be in Baltimore or DC. By the virtue of the Pennsylvania Railroad, he always found a way to get home every night to marry at the Rittenhouse. But as the delays in the White House work mounted, and of course, as we know, <laughs> the delays were inevitable. The job was on pace for the first few months, and then it started to fall behind. And then, of course, the Korean War started, a shortage of material, shortage of men. One thing led to another. Contractors who didn't show up, the union problems, the whole thing. It was all an enormous toll on McShane as he watched the job slipping further and further and further behind. And so in order to stay closer to the site, McShane just simply began staying at the Hay Adams. And Polly said, the White House was such a huge investment of time and interest in everything to him. He spent a lot of time at the Hay Adams. So here was a man who was not accustomed to leaving his wife alone in the evening, who now had to do that again and again and again. Now, here's the really fascinating thing to me about all of these memories of Polly's, which are incredibly acute and sensitive, and that is, that Polly wasn't on hand to observe any of these things at the time that they were happening. Because when her father got the White House contract, she had been a nun for two years already. She wasn't in Washington or Philadelphia. She was in Summit, New Jersey, where her order had sent her to teach second graders at the Oak Knoll School. So we talked about this a little bit because I had that Catholic school education thing in common with her. And I said, by the way, I would have been thrilled for a teacher as lovely as you. Polly told me a story of her parents coming up to visit her sometime in 1950. And around this time, thousands of old bricks that were being taken out of the White House, bricks, by the way, that I had been a judge too weak because of the temperatures that they had been subjected to in the fire, the ones that they had left in there, I believe. Um, so they had all these bricks tumbling out of the house. And many of these bricks became part of this wondrous thing called the White House Souvenir Program, which I think may just be the one and perhaps only thing that the federal government has programmed, the government has ever enacted that's just been loved by everybody. <laughs> so it worked like this. If you had a dollar and you sent your dollar to a P.O. box in Virginia, you'd wait a few weeks, and oh my god, they sent you a genuine White House brick in the mail as a souvenir with an authentication plate. And in fact, there was a whole catalog. You had all kinds of things, nails and chips of this. Sort of, but, but the bricks, that was the biggie. And so Americans love these bricks. And as it turns out, so did John McShane. 
uh, and he piled bricks into the trunk of his car, and he drove them up to the Sisters of the Holy Child Jesus in New Jersey. And Polly said, quote, my parents used to come to visit me. They'd drive up from Philadelphia, and I have a distinct memory of their bringing with them on one of those trips bricks from the White House. They gave them to us as souvenirs. And I was thinking, you know, we've all been there. You go visiting somebody, you just don't know what to bring. <laughs> Cheese, wine, bricks. <laughs> the problem was, for Polly, is that she had already been told that she would be going to Africa to do missionary work. And she said to me, what am I going to do? I can't carry these bricks to Africa. And I said, well, Polly, what did you do with them? Because they're worth about $500 a piece now. And she said, oh, I turned them into the archives. I think they're still there. <laughs> so I asked her then, because we got into this, I said, to, how often were you allowed visitors like your parents up there? And the answer was, not often. She said, we saw them every two or three months for a couple of hours. That was the way religious life was at the time. This was long before Vatican II, she reminded me. And women were pretty much removed from society. Why am I telling you that? Because it begs a related question, which is that if she was not only not in the same city that her father was working, but if she was secluded in the order, essentially cut off from the outside world, how then did she still know so much about her father's, not just what he was doing, his thoughts, his feelings, his anger, his insecurity? How did she know that? Polly's answer to that question revealed yet another side of John McShane's personality and a very poignant one. Because here was a man who worked day and night running an empire pretty much by himself. Here was a man who was in and out of the railroad station in Philadelphia more times than he could count. And yet, despite it all, he never failed to do two things every day. One was go to morning mass. The second was writing a letter to his daughter. And he did that from the railroad. Polly said, quote, he always took the train because he worked the whole time from the train. Most of the letters he wrote me, and he wrote to me always, every day, he wrote from the train in his small handwriting. Uh, incidentally, I don't know if there's any rail fans in the audience, but uh, this, by the way, is a P-54 Pennsylvania Railroad coach. This is exactly the type of car that John McShane would have ridden on at the time. So the stories about John McShane being a steamroller of a boss, true, yet so were the stories about his compassion, because I ran across a lot of those, too. Paying an employee's doctor bills out of his pocket, handing envelopes stuffed with cash to employees who had gone the extra mile for him. Polly, uh, Polly said, Daddy was a driver. He drove people and then he'd turn around after he'd been really hard on some of his superintendents and give them a bonus or say, why don't you take the afternoon off? He would drive, drive, drive them and then do something very kindly. It shows the two sides of him, she said. He was driven to perform well, yet he had a heart of gold. John McShane also had a determination to meet the obligations of his contract. And he did get Truman back into the White House. I would argue that he did it under deadline, although those deadlines had been nudged a little bit. But he still performed, I think, a heroic feat uh, of his profession. But the public never learned how much Don McShane sacrificed to get Harry Truman back into that house. In the final days of the work, McShane paid for many things personally. Money for overtime pay for the workers, in particular Hasbrook's parquet contractors who had this habit of not showing up at all or sending only one guy to lay parquet for the whole first floor, which you don't have to be in the parquet business to know that's not a really good way to approach it. That came out of McShane's pocket, not his business accounts, his personal account. The White House budget toward the end had no money left for period-appropriate furniture. 
I don't mean the Drexel reproduction stuff that was put in initially. I mean actual really good furniture. I mean, McShane didn't have the money for all that either, but he did buy a very beautiful and expensive antique desk just for Harry Truman and gave it to him, gave it to a president who had never treated him well. And when the commission didn't have the $2,000 for the commemorative plaque for the ground floor corridor, McShane paid for that too, even though that plaque put McShane at the very bottom of the pecking order, below the junior architect, in fact. But McShane was gracious about it. Unfortunately, a deeper insult was coming. And I had mentioned this before. The commission published an official book about the renovation work, and this is actually one of the originals. So this was the, this was the deluxe printing. It came in like red Naugahyde. Um, and it made no mention of John McShane, except for one appearance in the very back of the book in the fine print at the bottom of the page. And this was something I had to ask Polly about was your father's pride injured when he was given that kind of treatment in the official record? And she said, oh, yes. He was angered that he wasn't given more recognition for the challenge that this had been. Nonetheless, she said, he continued to the day he died to be proud of it, the White House. He never stopped bragging, she said. And he bragged a lot. All this talk of how difficult the White House job had been prompted me to wonder, what building did John McShane take genuine pleasure in building? Was there one that didn't have that precious? Because God knows, building the Pentagon wasn't easy either. So what did he enjoy about his job? Was there a building, anything that stands out? Yes, in fact. It was the presidential library for Franklin Roosevelt. Polly said that was the most fun building he'd ever built. And I want to tell you this story in closing, even though it's not really about the White House, because it speaks so well to John McShane's character and to Polly's too. So in 1941, eight years before taking the White House job, John McShane built a library for FDR. This, was, uh, this would establish a pattern of presidential libraries that we now are very familiar with. He built it on the grounds of FDR's estate, about 100, 120 miles north of New York City on the Hudson River. Fortunately enough, very close to where I grew up. John McShane, I should mention, was a very conservative man. He had not voted for FDR. He did not support FDR's policies. Nevertheless, in the course of building the library, the two men became very good friends. The Roosevelt-McShane friendship included invitations to lunch at FDR's Hyde Park estate. And Polly went up for one of those lunches. In 1939, she would have been 10, maybe 11 years old. And I thought, my god, you had lunch with FDR. What do you remember? What was it, turtle soup, London broil? What do you remember? Not much, as it turns out. What Polly did remember, though, was FDR's car. Roosevelt, who, as we know, had been paralyzed from polio, had a 1936 Ford fitted with special hand controls that allowed him to drive with his hands. And by all accounts that I have found, driving with FDR was uniquely terrifying. <laughs> he was a speed demon. So after the McShane's lunch, FDR asked the McShane family to go driving with him. And they accepted. And I asked Polly, was that scary? And she said, oh, FDR could handle it. I went in the car, and Daddy was in the front with the president. And my mother and I were in the back seat, in a convertible, she remembered. It was an adventure. Only then did it hit me that I was actually having a kind of adventure, too. Uh, not only talking to the last living person who'd survived a drive with FDR, 
but the daughter of the man who'd brought a very important story full circle. 150 years after one Irish architect had built the White House, an Irish entrepreneur and builder had rebuilt it. It is very, very easy to learn the technical aspects of that job from the surviving record, but to learn about the man behind it, I had to meet his daughter. It was a privilege for me to meet her, and it's also been a privilege for me to share her with all of you. Thank you.